So, um, so I was asked to be here um, today to sort of give you a broad perspective on the energy sector. And, uh, and I was really excited because basically it's, uh, it's what I do every day. Um, I just literally eat uh, energy information. And uh, so, um, and I thought, okay, you have a 20 minute presentation. Like, that's no big deal, right? And then you go to write it, you know, 6,000 words later. And you're like, yeah, no, these people will be totally bored by the time I'm done after a really long day like you guys have had. So, um, anyway. So what um, my goal here is, uh, is just to give you uh, uh, that overarching perspective. You guys got a lot of really detailed uh, information today, and I really want to thank all the speakers um, and thank the, uh, the organizers because really, you've set me up. I don't need to explain any of the stuff I'm going to talk about today, which is great. Um, this thing is like right in my face. Is it loud or sh is, it o is it okay? Yeah, okay. It's just, it's like right there. <laughs> Uh, oh, and I got to figure out how to use this thing. Oh, look at that. Okay. Okay. What, it works. Imagine. <laughs> All right. So, um, so the Atlantica Center for Energy. Um, just uh, really, really briefly, and this is not about Atlantica at all, um, but what we are is we are a, a proud and informed voice um, on the energy sector in Atlantic Canada. Um, our members represent some of the largest energy producers, consumers, consumers, distributors um, throughout Atlantic Canada. Many of them might be your, either your clients, your partners, um, or, um, or stakeholders. And, um, and what we really want to do is foster partnerships, um, facilitate dialogue, and our, we have a big mandate around energy literacy, which is one of the reasons why um, I'm happy to do these kinds of things, because the more information we can get out there, um, accurate uh, information that you can take away into your worlds, um, the better. So, um, so let's start with energy literacy. Um, the energy sector in Atlantic Canada is a huge contributor, not only to GDP and jobs, um, but it generates a significant amount of income in our region. So we have about 14,000 jobs in Atlantic Canada uh, in the energy sector here, and um, most of those jobs would be in uh, Newfoundland and New Brunswick primarily. Um, but if you can see the difference in Canada's, uh, so share of real GDP um, compared to Atlantic Canada, you know that the energy sector is huge. And a lot of that has to do with exports. Um, so one of the things that kind of excites me is that I really think that Atlantic Canada is on the... Seriously? That's my daughter. My daughter is calling me right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that would have been, hey, so what's going on? <laughs> They're 20. They have no concept of, like, anything outside of their own worlds, right? Like, anyway. Uh, yeah, so, um, so I, you know, I'm excited about this because hopefully when they graduate university in a couple of years, they'll have jobs. Uh, one of them is in business, and I'm really hopeful that they'll um, pursue a career in the energy sector. They've been working for Irving Oil for the last couple of work terms, um, which is great. That's an intro to the energy sector, but it's so much more than that. Um, and the other one is going into criminal criminology, so I'm not quite sure what she's going to do. It'll be interesting. We'll see. Um, anyway, I digress. Uh, where am I at? No idea. Um, okay, so um, basically we generate about $1.6 billion of wages um, in, the, in the region to the energy sector. And energy sector investments have really been transforming our region. I mean, if you think about some of the really massive projects that we've had in our area, so like the $14 billion Hebron project, uh, the $10 billion and counting Muskrat Falls project, um, there's, a, there's a lot of things happening that um, are generating a lot of uh, wealth. Most recently, the Public Policy Forum had an Atlantic, um, what I call an Atlantic Momentum Index, and they were really, really positive about what's going on here in Atlantic Canada. Um, and so we see what's going on, and I can tell you we are really excited. Um, one of the things that we're really excited about is the fact that we are a highly diversified um, and highly um, energy secure region. And I know you guys have heard that term, especially related to um, the, the Ukraine uh, war, the, the Russian um, uh, unsolicited um, war on Ukraine, but energy security is something that we should be really proud of. It should be something that, um, that we recognize as a real strength in our region. 
And if we think about energy production in our region, we're really blessed with several uh, extremely important assets that not only um, help drive economic activity, um, but are also essential, again, to that energy security. So Irving Oil operates the largest oil refinery in Canada, 320,000 barrels of oil per day uh, in our region. Um, the Newfoundland oil and gas sector generates um, about $85 billion, a billion barrels per year. Um, uh, over the last 10 years. We also have, and we heard from today, Eastward Energy, but Nova Scotia and New Brunswick have really uh, relatively new um, natural gas transmission systems, and, um, and it's definitely something that we should be um, aware of because we import 96% of the natural gas that we actually use in this area. Um, so if we look at our electricity grid, and you heard from Nova Scotia Power today, which is um, awesome. Again, I don't have to talk about a lot of this stuff, but all of our region uh, in Atlantic Canada is very diversified, very different. Our energy systems are quite, um, our electrical grid is very different. Um, we all have the mandate to phase out coal-fired uh, electricity, and you'll see that New Brunswick and Nova Scotia both have a tremendous amount of fossil fuels still on our electricity grids. Um, and we have the policies that are upcoming that are really going to change um, what this chart is going to look like. So if we look at 2026, uh, we have 20% zero emission vehicles. Um, in 2030, off coal, 60% zero emission vehicles, a carbon tax of $170 per ton, it's massive. 2035, we're looking at a net zero grid, 100% uh, zero emission vehicles. 2040, uh, net zero PEI, and some cities um, are actually in the, in the region are looking to be net zero. On top of that, um, we are potentially looking at a natural gas ban on new homes, oil and gas emissions, output-based pricing, energy efficiency mandates, and the list goes on. And a lot of those still aren't even finalized. So when we look at um, these policies, they are really going to drive change in our area, especially in the energy sector. They're going to drive a lot of investment. So um, most recently, the International Energy Agency reported on the future of the electricity grid and found that the world needs to build an estimated 40 million miles of new transmission um, by 2040. And in order to meet future grid demand, uh, investments need to happen roughly twice today's rate uh, to 2050 and triple, or 2030, and then triple annual spending afterwards. So if we look at what our grid looks like, I'm going to show you a few things. The Canada Energy Regulator is, um, uh, is looking at sort of scenarios. So they're looking out between here now and 2050, OK? Um, so this is New Brunswick currently, according to Canada's Energy Regulator. We're fairly diversified in New Brunswick. In 2050, um, it really changes. So we have a huge amount of nuclear still, wind and hydro, um, and then a little bit of everything else. In Nova Scotia, right now, you have a huge amount of coal, some wind, some natural gas. This is what you're going to look like, supposedly, by 2050. It's very dramatic. Um, so if you look at that change alone, that's massive. Who's going to support all those renewables? Uh, in Prince Edward Island, they're already hugely wind-driven. Uh, um, that's their own creation. Um, they get a tremendous amount of their power from uh, New Brunswick. And this is supposedly what they're going to look like in 2050. And in Newfoundland, uh, no change. <laughs> so they've got hydro, um, and they're blessed with it. So if you think about what that looks like between the four provinces, um, the, the burden of this energy transition is really on Nova Scotia and New Brunswick and Atlantic Canada. Um, Saskatchewan has a little bit. Alberta has a little bit throughout the rest of Canada. But there's a lot, there's a lot going on here. Um, so we know that um, we have the mandate to have a um, responsibly provide access to clean um, in a net zero future, clean energy. So that's going to mean uh, clean electricity, electrification efforts, um, clean fuels. I feel like I'm standing away. 
Um, and so here are some of the things that have been announced already. So MB Power issued um, an expression of interest for up to 220 megawatts of uh, wind, renewable sources, and uh, energy storage. Nova Scotia has selected five projects in 2022 that will produce a significant amount of wind, targeting five gigawatts of offshore wind. That's massive. A uh, new transmission line in uh, Prince Edward Island will really open up opportunities for new projects there. Newfoundland and Labrador, Labrador finally lifted a moratorium on onshore wind and have selected uh, four companies to develop wind farms, um, mostly for hydrogen export, although I do believe that there's going to be a domestic component to that. Um, modified Atlantic Loop was just announced, um, and as I said, you know, we kind of keep our ear to the ground on everything that's happening in the energy sector, and it literally changes by the day, and even like today, there's new announcements. It's by the hour. Um, so there's so much to pay attention to, and quick little plug, if you're interested in finding out what's going on all the time, um, we have a newsletter, and we do try and keep you updates once a month. So anyway, um, so the other really interesting thing that's going on in, uh, in Atlantic Canada is MB Power and uh, looking at uh, developing nuclear. So they've uh, recently applied for an um, environmental impact assessment and um, license to prepare site for the uh, Point Lepro nuclear generating station having uh, small modular reactors. Um, so, if we look at you know that previous slide with all of the different uh, generation changes, it's pretty dramatic. If we look at the timeline that's associated with what's going on, it's really quick. Like the first sort of major um, things that need to happen is 2030. That in I don't you guys build stuff right? Like you're involved in building things. It takes like years just to site develop environmental assessments, let alone plan and actually build out something. So, um, so we know that this transition is going to happen really, really quickly. And our utilities are going to need the support of industry and engineers in particular in order to make sure that this stuff actually happens. Um, so I'm, I don't know if you guys, um, you guys have had a lot of uh, presentations around uh, Nova Scotia, but this is uh, part of the Nova Scotia Clean Power Plan uh, that was released in October. And um, so, you know, again, they're looking at huge amounts of renewables added on and, uh, and talked a fair bit about how they're going to back that up. Um, I can just say that um, there's always going to be a need for fossil fuels on our grid, right? Um, at least for the for the relatively foreseeable future. Um, it's really important that we think about how we're going to add all this clean electricity to our grid and to ensure that reliability, right? Um, in Nova Scotia, you're still gonna have significant imports from Newfoundland um, and New Brunswick, along with uh, emergency fossil fuel fired plants, um, battery storage, and, uh, and we heard around the natural gas system today. But here's the thing, none of these investments will be cheap None of them will be quick to implement, and none of them will be without opposition, right? There's still a lot of people who do not want this in their backyards. High intensity weather events are becoming much more frequent in Nova Scotia. You all have seen that probably firsthand. Um, when we look at reliability and resiliency, we really need to be thinking about how do we support these projects in order to enable that. We must consider um, what we're already good at. What are we already good at here in Atlantic Canada? There's a lot of global jurisdictions. I mentioned nuclear, they're developing nuclear. Um, and uh, New Brunswick in particular and Canada is really well positioned to develop more nuclear. Um, we have expertise, we have amazing safety um, uh, mechanisms to ensure that, uh, that everything that we do is safe and secure. Fossil fuel fire generations can really help us meet those extreme demand peaks um, while emitting few emissions on an annual basis. Similarly, because of the transition off fossil fuels are not immediate, we really need to be thinking about making sure that we have a reliable network. We heard about EVs today, but we still have to maintain that reliable network of access to gasoline products, uh, fossil fuel, um, diesel, um, those kinds of things so that we can really have that smooth transition. So we know nothing is gonna change out overnight. Yeah, I question already. <laughs> I 
Um, this is from the Nova Scotia Power Plan, and um, which they just released in October, and it says currently being added to the grid. So it's under develop right now. That was, I think, like two years ago. They had a request for yeah, that the ones that were already awarded. So new, yeah, totally new. Right. No. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, uh, there's a lot, there's a lot happening that's going to need to happen by, where's my little, do I get a pointer? Look at that. That's like literally tomorrow. Like, I probably won't even be a grandma by then, right? Um, so, you know, you heard about, um, Where's my what's next? There we go. Um, so population growth is, um, we've seen a huge increase in population in Atlantic Canada since the pandemic. Um, we all know how important energy efficiency is to meeting some of these goals. And it's also financially an incentive for a lot of us um, who own homes. It makes a lot of sense. Um, businesses. Um, and... Um, one of the things that you probably heard um, a little bit about today was around fuel sw fuel switching. Um, so the you know the idea of doing RNG, uh, hydrogen. Uh, we've got huge transportation mandates. Um, those sort of 20, 60, 100 uh, percent zero emission vehicles. Those are for light duty vehicles. We're anticipating some um, additional. Um, mandates around heavy duty vehicles as well, which again is one of those harder to abate sectors. Um, the electrification of industrial applications is going to be really, really important to help us sort of reach those goals. And the reason why is because, and Derek did mention this earlier today, um, look at how much refined petroleum products we use in our region. So this is just refined petroleum products by province here, and electricity is at this point. So if we look at our entire energy consumption, it's really important to recognize that electricity is only one piece of it, just one. Energy consumption is a whole other. And if we think about that transition over a really short period of time, our electricity grid has been built and used for over 100 years. Right? So we're going to need to transition this in the next 20 to 30 years. Um, huge. And this is where engineers are going to come in. Like, you guys got a big job ahead of you. There's a lot. Um, residential and transportation sectors, again, huge. Um, industrial, if you look at you know, New Brunswick and Newfoundland, obviously they have a massive um, uh, industrial um, use of energy uh, in our region, but uh, the transportation and residential sectors are you know, equally as important to decarbonize. So it's not just about the electricity grid, even though they get an awful lot of bandwidth in the media, right? Um, it's probably the things that you pay attention to because um, you guys are affected as well. Um, on a personal note, you know, your homes, you know, things are costing a little bit more lately. Um, so one of the things that I didn't, I don't think, I wasn't here in the, this morning, but did you talk about smart grids at all? No? Yeah, like smart grids are, are something that we're going to need to talk about. The IRP did speak to sort of that distributed and um, and a, a little bit more around how that might play in for efficiency, but um, definitely uh, the smart grid aspect and the, the tools and technologies that um, that are available to us is definitely something that, um, that we should be looking at. Um, so in addition to mandates from government, um, on large industry to reduce their GHG emissions, it's really important to recognize that a lot of these policies that are coming out are really sort of climate change driven. Um, they are, um, they're driven from an environmental perspective, but because of the ESG components to, you know, you all work for companies, you care about the environment, you care about social and governance. Um, there is now becoming a little bit more of an economic uh, driver for industry to actually make investments. So um, some of the, the the policies that I'm hearing around um, industry in Atlantic Canada, that they want to buy from companies that have ESG mandates. They want to buy from companies that are paying attention to uh, their energy investments. And so I think it's really important for you as engineers to, to take that into consideration. Um, so one of the things that uh, we've spent a lot of time talking about is clean fuels. And um, because not everything can be electrified. 
right? So we're going to need to consider things like RNG, which Derek did a fantastic job talking about earlier today, um, hydrogen and other biofuels, so biomass, synthetic fuels, those kinds of things that can help um, decarbonize maybe the aviation sector, some of our transportation um, and industrial applications as well. Um, so, if we think about how we're going to make this transition, it's really important to understand that um, when we're developing clean fuels, we were talked about you know hydrogen projects. Okay, so these are all big export-oriented projects. Make no mistake that while that might be an opportunity, there's a tremendous amount of hydrogen that's actually already used here in Atlanta, Canada, um, in industrial applications. So if we can help clean up that aspect of it, I think we'll be doing a good job. I've lost my. There we go. All right. It took a while. Um, so some other really exciting projects um, around uh, biofuels and biomass that are already being considered for industrial applications. So um, I showed that uh, New Brunswick does have some coal still on the grid. Um, that coal at the Beldune plant is actually uh, looking to be replaced with biomass. So they're going to do a test um, of biomass in, uh, in Beldune this spring. So that'll be interesting. And if you think about investments and all the money that's going into all of this transition, um, it's really important that we think about how we can encourage those investments, especially when federal uh, government is putting money into this stuff. So it, sometimes it's a lot of work, but the only way you're actually going to get the money or make it financially feasible is to use the programs that are there. Um, okay. So all of this, everything that we're talking about, and I'll talk about this in a second, this little fuel for the future, remember that? Um, but uh, all of these investments will not be made if we do not have public support. And so this is really where I want to encourage you um, as trusted advisors um, to be thinking about how can you play a role in, uh, in public support. So um, whatever we do is not going to be cheap. I mentioned that before. Um, even if we take the most cost-effective path to net zero. So I think you asked the question earlier today around the IRP um, when Nova Scotia Power was, well, how much is, like, do you have a plan for the people, <laughs> basically? Because that's what we care about, right? Um, so when it comes in, uh, you know, en engineers are really that trusted source of information, whether at the boardroom table or at the kitchen table, talking to your kids or to your parents. Um, you know, having good information at your fingertips is going to be really important. Um, another really important piece of this energy transition is uh, Indigenous economic inclusion. So when you're talking to companies, your clients, your stakeholders, it's really important to encourage them. If they're not already thinking about it, they have to be. Um, they are going to drive a tremendous amount of this energy transition. Um, private capital, capital investment, we will rely on industry to get us through this transition. That's it. We don't have a choice. Um, government is uh, probably going to run out of money sometime soon. That's the way I see it. Um, and then, of course, uh, you heard a little bit today about the clean energy workforce. But honestly, um, when I talk to industry, so we represent, for the most part, industry, their biggest concern right now is workforce. Um, there is a real issue um, with workforce. And so that project, that uh, the Fuel for the Future project, we actually got some funding from uh, the NRCAN in order to do a clean fuels awareness program where we're going to try and connect post-secondary students in STEM programs throughout Atlantic Canada with industry who is hiring. And the industry who is hiring are dirty fossil fuel companies. But they're the ones who are going to be making the transition. They're the ones who are investing in our clean energy future. And we need to be talking to our young people about how if they really want to affect change, they need to go and work for some of these fossil fuel companies in order to really make those changes. Um, so there's some big investments happening in our region in organizations where they're trying to transition away from fossil fuels. And, uh, and so I think there's an opportunity, again, for engineers, get out into the university and the college, talk to them about where the opportunities are, um, get more people into engineering. We need more engineers. Didn't I see a little button today? Um, Chris, is, where's the, there's a little button that says, engineers save the world, right? Little pink button. Anyway, he's not, he's not far off. Um, so Canada's future economy, they're looking at 700,000 new energy jobs in clean fuels above and beyond the transition that's going to happen out of fossil fuel organizations, uh, fossil fuel fired um, jobs. 
And um, all right, so I put my plug in for that. All right, um, so I'm gonna make sure I do a couple little things here. So while um, workforce and economic development really shouldn't be at the forefront of this energy transition, one of the things that it can be though is the byproduct of really good planning. So if we're thinking about this in the back of our minds, then, um, then we can really execute. Indigenous economic inclusion, workforce um, should be a, a real focus along with regulatory framework. Um, the Atlantic provinces can attract investment in the energy sector, create jobs, and grow wealth throughout this energy transition. Um, we're really happy that some of the most recent energy projects that have been announced um, are, um, are include Indigenous. Um, so, as I mentioned from the beginning, uh, Atlantic Canada is really on the cusp of an exciting transition. Nope, not that one, that one. Um, if we look at the future energy projects, so these are some things that maybe um, a little bit have been announced, but these are massive projects, huge investment in our region. Um, and so we, um, we're really excited because if we take advantage of those strengths that I mentioned earlier, so we are on the East Coast, we have an excellent offshore industry already. Nova Scotia has experience with offshore natural gas development, Newfoundland with offshore energy projects. Um, we have vast onshore and offshore wind potential. Um, and, uh, and people are getting really excited about that. Like it's, it's a pretty big deal. Like the federal government paying attention to Atlantic Canada for the first time ever is a really big deal. <laughs> like there's, there's a real potential here. So we should really be jumping on that bandwagon. Um, if we look at um, the trade routes that we already have established in a hugely energy hungry region, there's no wonder that those hydrogen projects are gonna be developed, but they're also gonna need to have some uh, domestic components to that as well. Um, so there's a lot on the horizon, um, and I have to say engineers are really going to be at the backbone of this transition. So it's important you recognize the role that you'll play um, as we move things along. Um, so I mentioned a whole bunch of stuff really quickly. I know you guys have had a really long day, so I didn't want to shove too much down your throat, but if there's anything here that I touched on today that you want to know more about, highly encourage you reach out to me all my contact information i'm on linkedin um we have a, a pretty good um uh social presence on linkedin and twitter or x now whatever it's called and uh and so i'd be happy to connect with you beyond that um and uh so thanks for your time and uh and your attention and um enjoy the rest of your meal Any questions for, for Michelle? Yeah, we're in the questions too. Right. Too fast, too yeah. fast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're just waiting. <laughs> It is, it is against the rules for Nova Scotia Power to own a nuclear facility. Yeah. And Canada is championing now. Yeah. And this is something extremely good, right? Yeah. Small nuclear reactors, something that will change uh, the way that uh, small um, modular energy models yeah. are being used around the world. Yeah. So,
Yeah. You're still, hydropower is still, yeah. And, and then, yeah. Uh, I have a couple of pieces of advice for you. One, I'm going to go back to what I said earlier. When you're at the kitchen table and you're at the boardroom table, talk about it. Okay. Nothing is going to happen without public support. So if we don't have public support for nuclear, it'll never, you'll never have it. But do you remember that little modified um, intertie that's going to go between Nova Scotia and New Brunswick? Um, that is going to go literally directly to the Point Pro nuclear generating station. That specific facility or their site is actually going to be where some of the new development is happening. So that might solve a little bit of the problem. Um, but um, Newfoundland took their onshore wind power ban off. The government just announced a, you know, they're backtracking on the carbon tax for, um, for heating oil. So at the end of the day, there is an opportunity if there is enough talk about the want to change some of these policies. And for whatever reason why it was put in 20 years ago that they couldn't, I, I don't know. Um, but again, loud voices, loud voices will enable and disable a lot of those things. The other piece of it is misinformation. If you, if you have, if you see in your newspaper a giant nuclear plume saying that we're going to proliferate uh, nuclear weapons in New Brunswick, you need to call somebody out. It's ridiculous. It's absolutely ludicrous. It will never happen anyway. So yeah, it's public support at the end of the day. Can do is literally the, the it's the safest energy source. Um, and it's uh, the can do technology owned, run, started, intelligence is all owned by Canada is just phenomenal. Um, there is an Ontario just announced that they're gonna put, I think, two or three new can-do reactors on their grid. Um, I mean, we're looking at doubling and tripling the size of our electricity grid. You are not gonna do that with, with renewables. Um, you need to have that solid base load of power, so, yeah. Yeah, a lot of the projects, um, utilities are going to rely on those partnerships. IPPs are um, probably the only way that any utility is going to be able to do this. Um, in New Brunswick, for example, we have a Crown Corporation. They're $5 billion in debt. They are not building any more infrastructure. It's not going to happen. Um, and uh, in Nova Scotia, likely the same things. We're also seeing a lot of Indigenous and First Nations ownership and community support for these wind projects. And I think most of the, I think, like the re request for expression of interest um, in New Brunswick, they had something like, I'm going to get the numbers wrong. Anyway, 90% of the applications that came in um, all had Indigenous or First Nations as primary partners. Um, and, uh, and so those projects, those will win every time. Um, and they make their money back over time. So they have like a 20 or 30 year um, lifespan on them. And so they'll, it's, a, it's a guaranteed rate for a utility to buy from them and your, your um, investment is paid off. So. Yeah, lots of opportunities for communities. And it, here's the thing, we talked about public support. Communities saying, I want this in my, my backyard, those ones will 100% get the projects. And they'll get the developers who want to work with them when they're saying, we want to be part of this. So, yeah. Any other questions? I'm also happy to talk about um, nuclear and hydrogen at any point in time. Um, those are two things we spend a lot of time on and certainly happy to talk with you one-on-one -on -one about any, uh, any other energy source. So yeah, geothermal is also really cool. So. <laughs>